We also have a class site um, that we want to highlight. We update the site frequently, and here you'll find our schedule, resources, lecture slides, uh, dictionary, and class recordings. We also want to remind you to check out our data dictionary so that you can um, add to it as we're going along and um, learning every week by week together. Um, and so here's a QR for the class site. Um, if you scan it in your phone, you can um, pull up the website. Next slide, please. And also um, some more course information you will find there. Um, and we encourage you to visit this year's theme we have what is the possible world we want to see built together? And then there's just some classroom reminders. Um, we will ask that you maintain your on mute. Um, and when for questions and answers, we're going to um, put our questions into the chat. And then when we're ready to have the Q&A at the end, then we can answer some of those or you can come off of mute and ask your question. Um, but we also wanna reference that we have a, a land acknowledgement that we have posted on our website and want to share a content warning that oftentimes the lectures can have strong content um, and that are difficult around issues of social justice and equity and human rights. Please step away and take care of yourself if need be. Um, and again, please share with us any reactions or anything that may be coming up. Next slide, please. And so we want to ask you if you could please help us improve this class and help us refine some of the, you know, the goals that we have and, and just these competencies around learning that you know, we've, we've get gained um, and sharing with you all. So if you can scan this uh, QR code, it's also, Emily has also put it in the chat. And if you could do us a big favor by filling that out and so like that we can adapt and continue to grow as a learning community. And then I am so happy to introduce a friend and neighbor, uh, Leone. He is the founder and executive director, or Leone and Kevin. Um, but first, Leone is the founder and executive director of Working Family Solidarity. He is the proud son of Mexican and Italian immigrants. He has worked for 30 years organizing workers and worker families of all backgrounds for economic and racial justice. He was a national staff with the Immigrant Worker Freedom Ride, and he's also worked as a long-term volunteer in Nicaragua during the Contra War. Leone has recent, recently become the executive director of Chicago Workers Collaborative, a Chicago-based worker center, where he founded the Bringing Down Barriers program to unite African-Americans and Latino temp staffing workers to win more rights at work, which is not a small feat. Leone was also a founding board member of Raise the Floor, an alliance of eight worker centers in Illinois. So thank you, Leone, for being here and also thanking Kevin Johnson for um, sharing his time with us and his expertise. He is a lead organizer of Working Family Solidarity, organizing low-income workers, particularly African-American and Latinx, and their families for more workplace rights, access to better jobs, and housing stability. So with that, I think our two speakers and I give them the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us uh, and having me again. Uh, my name is Leone Jose Ikieri. I'm the founding executive director of Working Family Solidarity. Uh, I'm gonna present for about 20 minutes, 20 minutes maximum. And then my colleague, Kevin Johnson will, and then we'll do questions and answers. So I'm gonna have some photos. Some of the slides will have text. I'm not necessarily going to read the whole text, but um, just kind of maybe talk about a couple points on them. So 
If I have, am okay to share, I'll see if I can do that now. Let's see. Does that look okay? Yeah, we could see it. Can see it? Okay. So again, I'm not necessarily going to go into a lot of depth on each slide, but use it to go through. And uh, Working Family Solidarity was founded. So that's our logo. And you can tell just a, a darker hand and a lighter hand. And our philosophy, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about health in a minute. I'm going to talk a little more broadly about our work and our vision, how we got started uh, and sort of in a broader sense and kind of end by naming a couple campaigns, which then Kevin will talk more in depth about. Uh, and we will link it to health, uh, health and safety, occupational health and safety, environmental as well, and talk about our definition of sort of health as it relates to power. And so we're a worker-based organization. We believe in solidarity. And while we promote unity, uh, our belief is that solidarity is organized unity. So we're not just united, everyone's united. Okay, we agree. But what does that really mean? And what we like to think about is solidarity is there's a purpose for our unity. And we happen to believe that low wage workers, the majority of humankind, right? And especially in Chicago, African-American and Latino workers, um, Latinx workers, that we can unite and we're a majority and we can have a lot of power, but we need to overcome a lot of the racial divisiveness that we've all been trained to have inside of us. No one's born that way, but we're trained to do that. Our analysis as a class-based worker struggle organization is that our current political economy makes sure that we're trained and inculcated with beliefs that that other race, that other ethnicity, that other anything is not me. And so we can't work together. And that's very effective at keeping workers from coming together to address workplace issues and other things of great concern like gentrification. And so we believe deeply in racial unity. We don't believe uh, it's easy. We don't believe that we've mastered it. We don't believe we can just tell you a few things to do and you'll have it. But we, but we wanna be part of the struggle to work towards a unity that brings workers together and gives us power. And then all of our different communities, racially, ethnically, culturally, um, workers, we can all be doing better. So that's our belief. So that's us working family solidarity, the name in Spanish as well. Uh, I just mentioned a little bit about it. I'm not going to read every word there, but I talked a little bit about our mission uniting low-income workers of different backgrounds, especially African-American and Latinx. We focus in eight neighborhoods on Chicago's west, southwest, and south sides. They're um, majority African-American or Latinx families. And our founding board, founding executive director, but me, um, when we started, we decided we would all be African-American or Latinx on the board. Uh, and we have kept that for the last seven years and similar with all our staff. Um, we are not against one day possibly having a board member who's not uh, African-American or Latinx, but we wanted to especially start the organization and send a message to our community that we, we, low-income people of color, we have all it takes to win this struggle. Thank you very much. Really, really brilliant folks from other places. Please be supporters. We think that's great, but we actually can do this we know what we need to do um, and we need to come together to do it and we need power. And we believe that that power is the key to improving among many other things, our health, uh, health and safety on the job and uh, health and safety in our society in general. Here's a photo of a couple folks. This is an older photo. That's probably maybe 2017, probably 2018. I'm not gonna name everyone, but there's some a board member in there, two, one who's a current board member, one who's a former board member, one of our um, great members uh, in the brown shirt, Ana Alvarado. It's one of the people who helped us start our first campaign that led to our major campaign that Kevin will talk more about later. Um, she lived in back of the yards at the time. 
uh, but was working uh, on the border of Pilsen, Little Village, and North Lawndale uh, in an industrial laundromat. And they ended up fighting for their rights at that laundromat. We supported them for about a year and a half, and it was a long struggle. Some of that is how I got to know some of the people at the uh, School of Public Health at UIC, although I knew some from earlier work. Um, so these are some folks from some of those early racial unity dialogues that we did. Just to throw a few names and faces so you're not just seeing me and Kevin today. Uh, I talked a little bit about our goals. We work mainly on labor rights, uh, but also in good job creation. Kevin will be talking more about that, but pushing for new and better jobs that all people can get uh, or get access to. Uh, and that leads us to work on some deeply interrelated issues. We can't work on everything, but we do work somewhat on immigration civil rights issues and criminal justice issues because so many um, of our members and constituents need that support, both in trying to get jobs, trying to apply for housing and so forth. So um, I'll leave it at that for that slide. This is an older folder, photo of one of our founding, uh, actually not quite founding, but early board members, Reverend Felicia Campbell and one of the young Latino um, interns and volunteers she had at her church down on 51st near Damon. And for the first five years or so of our existence, we've been around about a little over seven years, uh, she was very helpful in getting us started uh, and helping us um, to un unfold a lot of our programs uh, at her church and, pant and food pantry. Uh, I talked a little bit about the racial unity. So broadly speaking, not really about our campaigns here, but we conduct racial unity teaching. Some of you have been in those in the past. We tend to sort of choose an issue. Um, it could be housing or it could be civil rights, education. Obviously we do a lot with jobs. And then we talk about the history and different rights. So we don't just talk sort of racial unity every second, but then we urge people to explore some of their own experiences about how perhaps some of our communities have been kept from working together on some of those key issues. So that's something we do. And you can see a little bit the worker rights and tenant rights, um, criminal justice and so forth. So those are some of the things that we work, work on. Um, here's another photo. This one is, uh, might be 2018, possibly early 2019. Um, this was at a workshop on labor rights employment rights and so forth. And some of the people in here came just for that day. A couple others in that photo um, were pretty active members at the time. Just to give you kind of a sampling, a few photos here. I know some of those folks very well in the photo. A couple of them I just know a little. I talked a little bit about the racial unity dialogues. We're gonna be doing several this year uh, as we always do. And again, we like to do them where we pick a, for example, tonight's really great with the health and praxis and health and safety and so forth, and sort of non-traditional definitions of what it means to be healthy and how we're healthy and why we're unhealthy. Um, is it really a lack of education? Maybe. Uh, we think it's a lack of power. We think it all goes back to power. If we have the power to shape things uh, in the richest country on earth, uh, we you know, certainly could have a better healthcare system uh, and health and safety regulations on the job. So um, it's always good to talk about those things and then look at the racial aspect of all of those policies. And I'll talk maybe a little bit more about that or a little bit later and question and answer and so on, or Kevin might touch on them. Here's a photo from an ally, an important ally of ours, the Bethel Mennonite Community Church. Uh, they're near 15th and Laughlin, right on the edge of the Abla Homes housing complex. So southeast of the corner of Ashland and Roosevelt. So if you go to UIC and you're in the Western campus, you're going near there a lot. It's right behind that gas station, right, right across from that Jewel Osco. Prime real estate, right? Um, and people have been fighting against affordable housing there for a long time. Um, I'm going to leave it at that in case Kevin wants to go into more detail, but that's been a very important campaign of ours, especially last year. And we've remained 
very close to this church where this is where a meeting was held where some of us were there. Some of the church leaders were talking about housing issues and so forth. I talked a little bit about our justice campaigns, what we generally call um, when we started. Kevin's going to more going to go into more detail about a couple of those that are really key, so you can hear more details of what we're trying to do on the ground. Um, but we essentially, th the main ones that uh, will be talked about soon are, they weren't things that we, like say staff brought in and like, hey, we've done this research and this is what people should do over here. And so let's do it. And then we have to sell it, <clears throat> All right? You hear a lot of organizations that organize in the communities, right? Or at least I have over my lifetime, like, hey, this is a great plan. Now we have to sell it. Now we have to sell it to the community. We have to sell it to our members. We try to do minimal selling and more like, what are you up against? How are you up against it, especially at jobs or getting jobs and then somewhat of the housing element related? And what are you willing to do about it? Uh, and then together, let's figure out, we'll support you. I'll support Kevin. We have two other staff members, uh, Claudia and Farida. Uh, full time. And then we have a couple other consultants that help us with finances and stuff. But we uh, are really big on helping people to think through their situation, make clear that we will support whatever you're willing to do to fight to get, for example, slower line speeds or less chemicals at your work site and so on. Um, but people need to decide what they're willing to do to fight for it. Uh, we can't decide for them, right? Because I'm not going to lose my job. When someone at that laundromat at 19th of Washtenaw decides they're going to fight back. Uh, but we can let folks know that we support them uh, and at other workplaces where we've supported uh, and that we're willing to do, you know, whatever they want to try to do. Uh, and so they're not going to be alone. We can share our collective wisdom. We can share some ideas. And then that's how we fight. Uh, a long time ago, in early 2018, that led to this, which was. Uh, supporting immigrant workers, mainly Mexican women and women, some men from the northwestern state of Gujarat in India, which is right up against Pakistan. Uh, we learned a lot about Gujarat. We produced flyers in Gujarati. Uh, people were earning seven and eight dollars an hour. This was a few years ago, way below minimum wage, no overtime pay for hundreds of hours, you know, every payday. So people decided to fight back. Not everyone. Some of them did. Many of them did. All of the main leaders were fired as is normal. So if you haven't organized workers, um, if you want to answer legally, they'll say, is it legal to fire me for standing up for my workplace rights? And many lawyers will answer legally and say, no, it is illegal for them to fire you. When you ask us, you get the real answer, organizing answer. You'll all be fired right away. Highly liked. That's my experience after three decades. Uh, and then you'll file unfair labor charges and you'll file all kinds of retaliation. And it's not that you can't fight back and mount a really good fight, but you need to understand and we're big on making sure people understand what they're up against uh, but if they decide to go forward, you know, we'll be with them as as much as we can. And so this is at 19th and Washtenaw. This is just a little southwest, you know, as the crow flies, three, four hundred yards, 500 yards from the western southwestern edge of UIC School of Public Health right there on Taylor, right in Ogden. So it's in that area. Um, and folks fought. And after a year and a half, I'll leave out a lot of details. But a number of some folks wanted to do go through the Department of Labor. Some people wanted to do a private lawsuit. Some people um, did actions at work. So it was kind of a hodgepodge. This is right outside. That door you see is where, you know, like the supervisor would come out to see what we're doing. There's a camera. I didn't get in the picture. Um, these were some of, so the woman on the right, the two women with red jackets, um, they were two of the main leaders. They were fired, but they kept showing up. That was a rainy Saturday a long time ago. And we leafleted folks. Um, but folks ended up winning collectively. Some of it was confidential legal settlement, so I can't say the amount, but they won a, a ton of money. And the uh, company filed for bankruptcy, of course, to try to 
you know, escape, we managed to kind of get their assets and we managed to get a lot of money. Um, but then they sold the company to one of their cousins. And uh, some of you may know a lot about this, but if you don't, this is standard practice for the companies. If they sell to an immediate family member, they can still be liable. But if you sell to a certain non, so like not your wife, husband, father, mother, daughter, son kind of thing, brother, sister, if you go to a cousin, they can take it over and they had adopted a new name. So they went from three brothers industrial laundry, they clean like hotel stuff, um, to uh, Windy City Lawn. And so uh, they still operate, but the fight did cause them to start paying minimum wage for the first time ever. So people got almost double wages from like seven to eight bucks to like 14 at the time, now, now 15. So it was a long struggle, but they were really amazing. Um, and then I won't go into the next um, steps that Kevin will talk about, but that is where our bigger, broader campaign about some of these bigger industrial districts comes um, came in because they wanted to fight and came to us. And then when neighbors heard about what we were doing and some and workers, some of their friends, they came to us outside leafleting and said, this is really cool. Could we also take it to the broader industrial district that that this factory's in? And thinking of health, some neighbors across the alley on the other side of this building came to us and said, this is so cool what you're doing. We've been really worried about those workers for years, but could we work together because they spew a lot of ammonia and all kinds of these gases, right? From cleaning and dry cleaning laundry. And we get it in our yards and we've developed all these coughs and eye irritations. We've put in complaints to EPA and we formed an alliance with a couple of the homeowners. And what was really cool is they really understood that the issue here is health in a way, but maybe before health, it's power. And it's the lack of power of the workers inside that industrial laundromat that meant you're going to get a bunch of ammonia in your lungs and other stuff every day. Because they don't have the power to say, I don't want to use this anymore. Because if you're feeling bad 50 feet or 100 feet away, imagine what that worker's feeling 10 feet away or one foot away, right? And as we know, farm workers, right, factory workers throughout the world and in the United States, many of us tend to be workers of color. So there's a racial element as well um, as probably everyone understands, but that's something we continue to see every day. So for us, the answer to reaching health and safety at jobs is not as much education, although of course there's an educational element, but it's really more about power because we can tell workers, hey, we wanna explain how the ammonia damages your lungs. You've really done very little to help them. So those of you who are gonna go into the profession, help people have power, please, please. Because it won't really matter how much like your great thesis tells them about all these you know, neural toxins. If they can't say, I'm not gonna spray it today, it's not gonna help. And even though we may be shocked that people will still spray this stuff and breathe it, it's not shocking, right? When you work in this or you come from this background because people are deciding, okay, I'm worried about my health, but I like, I have to pay rent and my kids have to eat, right? So that's what people are up against. And so as we work together, one of the reasons we've had a very enjoyable, like Yvette was saying, we know each other, we know each other, Dolores, you know, is on this and I, I've recognized a bunch of other names, but we've had a very long, fruitful, enjoyable relationship with UIC School of Public Health because so many of the people that we've met are real and they are not afraid of those discussions. So in other words, we need to educate students, but we also want our students to be effective. And if they don't understand how to plug in their knowledge, it's not going to be effective, right? It's going to be like people will take the flyer and they're going to recycle it because people are worried about surviving. So we can work together and, and do a lot, but we got we to gotta look at those health outcomes together. Um, so if this was years ago, we just called it the justice campaign. 
Um, and I'm not even going to say the acronym, but at this particular industrial area, and Kevin will talk more about it later, I've just said a few things about it. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to move on. Um, so I'm going to actually end like in about another five minutes or so. But we got a lot of coverage on that. And in later 2019, uh, WBEZ, Chicago Public Radio, interviewed a couple of the people you saw in some of those of those uh, uh, photos. I was interviewed, but they mainly wanted to talk to the workers, of course. And, you know, we were starting to get that notoriety of where we wanted to push for higher labor standards, better hiring practices uh, going into 2020. And then COVID hit. Um, so, you know, we, it's sort of like some of this work has been on hold, but we're going to take some next steps together. And actually, several groups at UIC will be pivotal in that. Um, and we'll talk, you know, we can talk more about that later. But but now we're going to try to work on some of the other industrial districts. That's just a photo on the other side of that. So you're looking north. You're at, if you know that area, you're on 19th. You're at the corner of 19th and Washtenaw looking north. And on the other side of those railroad tracks is Lagunitas Brewery. So if some of you aren't kind of sure where I'm talking about. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you've had a beer there or gone to the tasting or whatever. But Lagunitas is on the other side of that. And right after that is Sinistar the big movie thing. So Kevin will touch on those things later, but that's where that picture is. Um, this was happened to be one of the lawyers that helped. Um, there was a bunch of different people that helped. And um, one of them was a really good guy, Perdon Jorge Sanchez. Those were two of the workers. That's Ana, the woman on the right is um, Maria Elena. And they were two of the ones who stuck with it a long time and, and, uh, and just absolutely courageous. Um, both of them, had workers' compensation cases. So just thinking of health and safety. When, uh, just to give you, some of you may know these things, but so Maria Teresa on the right, the one with the fist, this was probably 2017 or so, but before I met them, but they told me about this. So she told me. So when she hurt her arm very badly, very badly, I, you know, it's kind of like it'll never be the same, kind of tore all kinds of stuff they had her sign and in the name of time, I'm not going to like scan it or well, I've got it scanned somewhere, but I'm not going to show it, but you know, I can follow up with some people if you're interested, but they had her sign a statement saying uh, it was my fault. I got injured here at this industrial laundromat and, um, and I'm sorry. And I don't want the company to help at all, which is completely illegal. As you may know, when we got to know her, we supported her uh, to fight and she ended up recovering. It was confidential, but but a fair amount of money for the ignorance of the bosses. And Anna on the left, she also hurt herself at the laundry and um, and decided to fight on workers' comp. And I was in the car with her. I was giving her a ride. We were in my car when their boss called her and said, uh, and so I pulled over and she was listening. She could speak some English. I was kind of translating. And he said, you know, why are you putting this uh, this uh, workers' compensation case in? And she said, hey, man, I, I came to you guys. I told you I'm hurt. You're not listening. I don't know what to do. So I'm filing this case. Uh, you know, it's with your insurance. I'm not I'm not trying to go after you guys, but I deserve to get, um, you know, therapy and I deserve to have all my bills paid for and two thirds of my, you know, my salary paid uh, at the real salary it should be legally uh, for after four days of missing work. And the guy started screaming. I literally can't repeat what he said, because even if the warning says there could be some tough contents, I would be too embarrassed to do it. But he um, he said very nasty things and was like, I will destroy you. I will deport you. I will like come after your family. I know where you live. And I was sitting there. Right. And she was terrified terrified she was looking at me and she turned like like she froze um, but that's the strength of an organization i think because i think if she had been alone sitting at home single mom with a couple of kids she would have just abandoned it and i wouldn't have blamed her but i was sitting there not like i'm so great right but like i'm representing a lot of other people that are going to support a lot of members a lot of community residents supporters right a lot of people like you're not alone you're not alone. You're going to you're going to go through hell. Let's be real. Right. Let's be real. But sacrifices have to be made to win this fight. They just do. 
That's just the law of history. Check it out. We're not going to win this Monday through Friday, eight to five, right? And no sacrifice. That's just not going to happen. And so each person has to decide, what am I willing to do to push this struggle? Um, so I just sat there. I didn't like tell her, oh, don't worry. But I just looked at her and was like, you decide what you feel comfortable on, but you're not alone. And a lot of the stuff that the guy's saying is a bunch of bull. But you decide what you want to do. We're down for you no matter what happens. And if he comes for you, you're not going to be alone. I guarantee it. Um, and so she stuck with it. And the guy ended up totally eating his words. Um, but And so that was very gratifying. But people people get scared. And she was largely trying to improve you know, working conditions, health and safety at that plant. I'm going to speed up a bit here. Actually, I'm not sure I have any more text. Just a couple of photos. One of our projects is called Women for Green Spaces, fighting for equitable access to green spaces. So if you live in Lincoln Park and got a whole bunch of money, you can hang out in Giant Park, right? But if you live in a lot of places on the west, southwest, and south sides, you can't, you don't have access to really much of anything. Here and there, a park, and then a lot of those are used for mega festivals right in the nice time of year when we want to take our kids there. So that's our coordinator, Claudia Galeno Sanchez, uh, Women for Green Spaces. And she's talking to some folks that were doing a protest that we had organized. Um, another of our members at the start of the pandemic talking about how he could get sick, but he was not going to stop working because he, he couldn't. And he planned to put on masks and just, if he got COVID, he got COVID. Um, so again, are we going to say that, well, he shouldn't do that because if he's educated, he knows that COVID is very dangerous. And so it's a matter of education and, you know, public, like, like public health educating this brother as to why it's, you shouldn't go to work. But that means nothing to this dude, right? He's got, of course, it means something, but he's got some kids and he opted like, I can't not go to work. If I don't go to work for an hour or two hours saying, hey, I'll be there tomorrow, but I might have COVID, he's not going back and everyone else is going to work and they'll get new people. So really, again, we view health as um, uh, poor health as meaning there's inequity in power in our society. This was a photo from near Abla Homes. I got a few photos more and, and then I'm going to sign off and move over to Kevin. But this was a, a one of the fights um, that Kevin might talk a little bit more about, but it was an important one. And so we gathered people together, uh, some of the residents and others to talk about um, housing rights. Uh, this was us a couple of years ago testifying in front of a panel about certain uh, housing and, and, um, and job issues. This uh, here, far left, lower left, Tamika was the first person our organization hired after me some years ago, part-time, excuse me, and she helped us. That was a racial unity dialogue that we led at a religious kind of place called the Brother Darst Center in Bridgeport. Um, their doors aren't open anymore. I don't know if they ran out of funding or, you know, pandemic inflation, but and that was a good dialogue with a lot of folks that wanted to talk about what we're doing. Um, there's Kevin far left talking with residents of Abla Homes, kind of near west, near southwest side, where I was talking about earlier, trying to get them support. This is um, uh, an immigration workshop that one of our members set up. This was in late 2019, just before COVID. This is that same member, Esmeralda de la Rosa, talking uh, in front of City Hall when we were pushing for uh, access to better jobs. This was at Harrison Park. Some of the folks that came with us to uh, ask that the mega festivals not be allowed there um, so that we can use the parks. Uh, we were on um, CBS Evening News some years ago, so we've had some coverage. One of our members was on the CBS this morning. This was another early member. She said I could use her photo, but don't say her name. I just liked her smile a lot. Um, she's a South Sider. Uh, last three slides. This, I'm not going to go through it. This is kind of where we've been and where we're hoping to go, kind of building from a few early campaigns. Kevin will talk now in a couple minutes about some of the other bigger campaigns. You got Kev right there in the middle. Um, I always like this one in a way because Kevin's got two Spanish signs. And then the brother with glasses is Mexicano Chicano that speaks Spanish. And he's got the English sign. Um, but I really like that one because that's what it's going to take, right? Like, we're, we're not very different. And as workers, we're very similar. And um, we get up every morning and sell our labor to someone else. And if we came together, man, we'd do some damage. Very last slide. 
Our uh, new office is at 2272 South Blue Island, although again, we serve several communities. And, um, you know, just our work, our Facebook and website are just working family solidarity. So I'm going to move on so Kevin can talk a bit, and then we'll both be doing some question and answer and comments. And um, thank you very much for having me. Sorry, everyone. The, the bottom bar here was wasn't letting me pop up to hit mute as I was trying to share my screen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I definitely won't hold long. I believe we're only here to six thirty, so I'll try to keep my presentation a little bit brief. Six fifty. Six fifty. Oh, six fifty. You guys okay, are so good. Okay, yeah, cool, no, cool. No rush. Cool. Okay, so that's that leaves me a little bit of time to go more into details than what I was expecting. So. And, and we will Hello, take a break at 640. I'm sorry to interject. Well, we'll take a quick break at 640, but we'll be um, up until seven, but we have room for questions at the end. Okay, sounds good. Um, hello everyone, Kevin Johnson, lead organizer of Working Family Solidarity. Um, you all have met my colleague slash, uh, I call him boss man, um, executive director, uh, Leone uh, Bicchieri. Um, Today, what I'm going to be going over with you guys is a little bit more so of some of the details of what he was just talking about in his broader presentation, um, as well as some of the public aspect health effects that we have through the work that we're doing, um, public health effects that we're having during the work that we're doing. So first, I want to start off by introducing you all to our local targeted hire policy campaign. Um, this is a campaign based around one major issue, which is job security, job security for neighboring residents around large business slash construction areas in the city of Chicago. Our main focus is on what's called a PMD, um, and that's the acronym for it. In the longer terms, it's called a planned manufacturing district. Um, it's basically a business, uh, it's a business district zoned by the city of Chicago uh, for businesses and businesses only with special incentives and grants as well for being a part of those districts um, to basically the vision was it 25 years, almost 30 years ago, actually probably 30 years ago now when Harold Washington envisioned it, the envision was to keep manufacturing and jobs in the city from wanting to leave and go to the outskirts of the city, which would basically effectively take an entire workforce away from our communities. What we are doing and talking about here is what our issue is, is ultimately we want the city of, the city of Chicago currently has no standing requirements, uh, tax credit and or grant for businesses residing within uh, planned manufacturing districts to hire workers that reside in neighboring communities uh, or areas around those city limits near these districts. Um, our goal through this, through this campaign is to ultimately get an ordinance passed that would now have standing requirements that do have, whether it's through tax grant, whether it's through tax credits and or grants um, for each of these businesses within residing within plant manufacturing districts um, to ultimately enact local hire, targeted hire policies. Um, looking at thinking about some of our large health effects from that. So if you go down here, um, we have a generalized map that we created of basically the ideals that we would like the city to implement within this plan. So as you see here in this one, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Um, we have our total workforce. So we're asking that this section right here, 40 percent of every workforce base with it, within every business inside of the plan manufacturing district. Um, is from the residing communities. Here we have a 60%, which is the rest of the workforce that we're, we're basically saying, hey, you guys can continue to hire from wherever you like, especially for highly qualified technical positions that you may not be able to find those candidates in those immediate communities. Uh, within that, within the 40%, I'm sorry, I didn't move my bar down just a little bit. Here we go. Within those 40%, 
Within the 40% of global hire and target hire, we would like 50% to be from immediate community area workers. Um, and at least 50% to be from workers that live with inside Chicago, Illinois. Um, so whether that's on the east side, west side, south side, north side, that's not our issue. We just want to make sure that they do have a Chicago residency address. Um, and then within that, we're asking that at least 20%, um, which is basically about 20% of the 40%, to be at least Black and Latino workers. Out of that 40%, we're asking them in total, we're saying that at least 50% is fine to be any other race or ethnicity um, that may be qualified for the positions. Now, thinking about like the health effects and how that plays a role into this campaign, uh, we actually just leaf with it, which is um, basically us going into communities with flyering, sometimes different material or flyering. Um, other times it's through word of mouth as well. Um, talking with residents and community residents about their issues and concerns around not being able to have job security and placement within these districts. Um, the long-term health effects is that ultimately individuals have to sometimes, especially without proper transportation or relying upon public transportation, have to subject themselves a lot of times to 30 to 45 minute rides, regardless of weather or weather conditions, et cetera, or time of year to get to and from work um, inside of inside of places that ultimately pay enough for a livable wage, uh, which can ultimately have health and effects benefits directly there. Um, constantly, constantly having to travel from different sides of the city, um, especially into areas that they may not necessarily feel very comfortable in um, is a personal health risk and safety risk. Uh, but then also looking at the health risk from constantly being um, subjected to the pollution and et cetera from being on these public transportation vehicles and or traveling to and from work. Other health concerns and effects coming from this project would definitely have to be uh, the idealism of, um, of home displacement happening within these communities, which ultimately can have lingering and long-term effects with certain individuals. Um, we worked with a resident actually uh, I personally, I didn't work with her. Um, at that point, I wasn't hired on. But we've WFS, Working Family Solidarity, has worked with a resident before that ultimately had her home of two decades taken away from her. And not even within 365 days of that happening, um, she felt she felt very ill from the stress, um, the stress of it, uh, the stress of having to find a place to leave, to live, having to move all of her things out of her out of her lifelong home. Um, and these are conscious things that we are trying to make sure we can prevent through passing this ordinance as well in terms of safety and health concerns. I'm going to go to, we'll come back to that it's just a moment. So I'm quickly going to talk about their next subject, which is just calls for eviction. Uh, we're currently right now working with what's called with a coalition named titled Chicago Housing Justice League. Uh, where we are working with them specifically to help get what's called the Just Calls for Eviction Ordinance passed. Now, what Just Calls for Eviction is, is, actually, I'm sorry, one second. I knew I forgot to pull up one slide. Come on. I just want to have it on the screen so everyone can kind of read along with me a little bit as I go deeper into what Just Calls for Eviction is. Here we go. Uh, so Just Calls for Eviction um, means in certain aspects that, as you're reading directly from here, that landlords can only evict renters for problematic behaviors or other lease violations um, that were already contractually agreed upon. All other reasonings to remove a renter required at relocation assistance, as well as other other different things that we're adding into this ordinance, um, be provided so that renters have the financial means and stability to move if they're being forcibly pushed out of their homes. So currently right now, Chicago does not have any regulatory factors that stops landlords from basically what we call is no cause evictions, uh, meaning they have no actual legitimate reason or contractual reason that we that any that the renter has broke 
um, and yet they still can legally evict someone and or force someone to move from their home. Uh, the goal with just calls for eviction is to make sure that there's basically higher labor, higher, higher landlord standards to make sure that eviction, that the what's happening in eviction court currently right now, which is basically, I'll be very honest with you, eviction court basically rolls like this. If you have a lawyer, you have a possibility of winning your case. If you don't, you're basically guaranteed to lose. Um, and that's pretty service through most of the city, um, most organizations, as well as anyone who has ever been involved, unfortunately, either personally with eviction courts, unfortunately, has already figured this out. Um, it's at about about a 90 percent rate for people who do not have legislation. I said legislation, legal, legal attorneys with them or uh, legal assistance with them in the process of this, that ultimately, regardless of the proof or non-proof that they bring, um, they're basically evicted or forced to then go through the proceedings with the eviction. This would basically apply different landlord standards that would allow certain instances, that would allow landlords to not have as much control over people's lives and ultimately displacing folks from their homes and from their communities. Now I got to go back to the other page, which is right here. So actually, no, I think I got it up. Yep, I already do got it up right here. So looking at some of the health concerns, health, whether it's physical health, mental health, or a, a mixture of both, um, we're looking at some of the health causes. The just cause for eviction ordinance would help reduce evictions in Chicago, in Chicago, homes provided and essential homes provide an essential element of human flourishing, literally safety, health, community, and base for a living and happy, fulfilling life. Most individuals, whether they have kids or not, um, do have family and or individuals that rely upon themselves of having that residence. Um, effectively removing someone from their apartments and or their homes without just without just calls or without no calls at hand is effectively harming them in multiple different ways and fashions uh whether it's physically like i said physically mentally and also financially um so evictions here are a couple of just couple of ideas, couple of different uh examples evictions harm health by worsening living conditions um, evictions lead to reduced quality housing and or homelessness, which is at one of the highest rates it's ever been right now currently in the city of Chicago. Uh, evictions can cause stress and serious health problems, as I just had recently stated about an incident we had with one of our members who unfortunately fell ill after dealing with uh, eviction proceedings in her lifelong home. Um, thinking about women, especially evictions. Definitely, even more so in an exponential rate, are mothers, infants, and children. Um, having not having a proper situation or home situation to be able to raise your family, to allow your kids to feel safe and comfortable, as well as keep them from homelessness and dealing with the, the different um, factors that come with that. Um, then also thinking about simple things like my internal depression and postpartum depression. Um, Looking at academic performances within kids uh, by obviously not having a safe, stable, a safe, stable home to go home and actually progress the things that they've learned in school for the prior day, um, and et cetera. Next, we have evictions evacuate financial instability, which obviously is probably the biggest. Well, what is it the biggest one? But it's one of the ones that would anyone would think, you know, being evicted would obviously cause you some financial instability whether or not you actually have the financial means to actually gather resources to purchase a new apartment and or find a new apartment and or a new home um, is different. But a lot of individuals that are being forcefully evicted or no cause evictions don't have this. They don't have the opportunity to save the money necessary to do that. They end up having to do what's called doubling up, which is basically living with someone else under a shared roof um, and or they're forced into homelessness. Um, the last two things, eviction calls, displacement, loss of community connections and community destabilization and gentrification. Um, ultimately, the more people that are evicted from especially uh, predominantly African-American and Latino-American communities um, are just leaving 
open lands for large developers to come in and buy it at pennies on the dollars was compared to them, which is also which is ultimately increasing gentrification in our communities um, and consistently displacing folks from their current communities, uh, whether it's because of rise of property increase, property tax increase, um, rise of rent increase calls because of new developments around, et cetera. Uh, and finally, eviction patterns reflect structural racism and class inequity, both root causes of health inequity. So to go a little bit more into that, it's basically talking about the structural, not even necessarily, I don't even want to use the word structure. Uh, it's basically talking about the foundation of what racism and class inequity is built on, which is oppressing, uh, oppressing black and brown folks, African-American and Latino American, especially folks um, to ultimately have benefit for large developers, companies, the city, et cetera, um, that don't actually help the residents of the city. Um, at its worst, Chicago has had a 30-year longevity gap, um, a major health inequity, the largest in the U.S., linked to inequitable living conditions, comparing predominantly white and wealthy neighborhoods and black and low income slash high poverty neighborhoods. These are the results of the economic and also economic foundational injustice and structural racism within our systems that are set throughout our city. Um, and all of this information, I just want to make it very clear, all of this information is available. Um, I'm going to show you the website. It's available for anyone to look at a little bit more. There also is a ton of more resources to take a look at at Just Cause Chicago. Actually, I'm sorry. Am I saying that wrong? Yeah, just call Chicago dot work. Um, so please take down that name if you would like to look more into this. Uh, we're always looking for more supporters as well to come out and support us in this process. So definitely take a look at it. Um, I'm going to quickly go a little bit faster because I'm only going to go about five more minutes. Um, no, 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 no fast, please. No fast. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about speaking fast. Um talking about in terms of finishing my presentation. Uh, here we have what's called, here we have an example of some of the flyering we use for our canvassing and leafleting as we're going into these communities. Um, so obviously our title is we want and we need, um, which is what we actually should add in there, we want, we need local hire, targeted hire in PMDs, plan manufacturing districts. Um, basically giving information to local residents as we're talking to them that may not know about local hire, targeted hire, and what the and what is necessarily the benefits from it. Um, so here in our first paragraphs, um, and this is double-sided because we, we cut them in the middle. Um, so this is the same thing on both sides. Uh, we talk about what is local targeted hire, which is local and targeted hire policies require or incentivize that businesses that receive public resources such as government contracts or tax breaks to hire workers living in a particular area or from specific populations, so nearby residing areas around these districts. Um, local hiring policies focus on ensuring that people residing near and impacted by these are gaining access to the job opportunities that they're able to create in their communities. Um, the problem and the issue is, is currently local hiring policies are not required throughout the city of Chicago or Illinois business districts. Um, our goal is within this ordinance to start off on a small level with plant manufacturing districts, which would, which in our eyes is a small level, but nonetheless is approximately 10,000 plus jobs between the 16 districts that may become available because of this. Um, we're basically trying to make sure that these policies are actually required now and mandatory within all planned manufacturing districts, um, like I said, to stop displacement gentrification in the city. Um, here, this is specifically about a specific area. We normally do different flyering per area we're working in. So this one right here is about PMD number eight, plan manufacturing district number eight which is in the Union Stockyards, um, which is near the back of the yards area. So between 47th and Ashland and 39th and Halsted, uh, for the most part, and a lot of the businesses in between there are part of this PMD 8 district. So we just give a little bit of brief, blah, blah, blah. we just give a little bit of brief background history 
on what a plan manufacturing district is, what the actual use is for it is supposed to be. Um, and then we go into talking about what what the uh, what the plan manufacturing districts are supposed to be doing for community members, which is supporting new job growth and local job opportunities in these nearby communities. Um, but once again, without proper regulation set, as well as no mandatory factor requiring these businesses to have local hire targeting hire implemented within their system. Um, unfortunately, this is not actually being done to this best of potential. Um, and finally, like I said here, our goal within the PMD districts is to assure local hire targeted hire policies are mandatory, allowing for exponential economic and job growth within neighboring communities. Um, and then we have our contact info that we leave when we go out to flyer. Uh, looking for one more thing, guys. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out what tab I had. Actually, that might be it. So, actually, that is it. So, we went over a few different things today. You talked about local hire, target hire. It's a, it's public health concerns and effects because of it. Um, we then went to talk about just cause for eviction, the harms and harmful ways of the public health effects that have on people that are forcibly being evicted for no cause evictions um, and what we're doing in that campaign. Um, I also briefly showed you all our policy brief we worked on, uh, which ultimately it will be our proof of concept for the creation of this bill. Um, this is also available on our website here at www workingfamilysolidarity.org. Um, all of this information is available for you to take a look at and to look a little bit deeper if you do get a chance. Uh, we're also also always looking for new members and new membership as well, um, supporters, allies, um, and different ways for people to volunteer and work with us. Um, so if this does interest you and you are in the city of Chicago, um, please reach out to us. We would love to talk and possibly work with you. Um, that's going to be it for me today. Um, I'm going to give the, I'm not sure who I'm supposed to be giving the floor back to. Thank you, Kevin. Better. Yeah, um, I appreciate both of you. If we can take a three minute break and come back at 6.37 on, I think I have the right time. And then we'll please stay for Q&A and then we'll jump in with some questions. Thanks everyone. Welcome back. So we're gonna start the Q&A portion. And I do wanna start with um, those who have their hands raised and then I'll also jump into the chat after that, the questions that are asked in chat. So um, Tambra, can you please um, start with your question? Okay, so my question is, first I'm a statement, then a question. Okay, I understand what you're doing. I'm talking about the housing situation to make it, um, well, you're making it more difficult for them to evict people. I have a concern because one of them, as a realtor, I can see where this can push it the way you're going to have less housing for people are not going to be want to rent. So I don't know what all of the, the requirements are. So I'm, I'm kind of concerned that you're going to make it so far from one side and not to the other side. And I do know that it's a lot of uh, illegal eviction. So I'm not questioning that. I'm not quite sure what I hear is going to make it better. Because I know here, and I'm in Atlanta, that most people here will not rent to Section 8 because of the issues that go on as far as them leasing their property. Next, it has to go with, like I said, I'm a realtor. And one of the things that I would like to see instead of pushing renting is pushing ownership. It's one of the biggest racist components that we have in this country that started way back in the 30s and 40s. It's not allowing people to own their own property. So one of the things to do as far as looking at housing, because some of the programs um, like Section 8 now actually have it where you can own your own property. So you encourage people to own so they don't have to worry about eviction. So do you have something in place that can actually help them? And I know you got the credit score, you got down payments and all that, but it is programs out there that will actually move people into their own homes. And I think that will be really helpful. I'll I'll say something and then you know see see if Kevin wants to say something or not. So and I'll go with the last first home ownership. 
we agree with you that it's ideal. It's not realistic for the majority of our members to just, you know, it's not a question of financial literacy or they don't know how to save. But, you know, when you've got zero in your bank account at the end of the month, just by paying rent and making sure your kids eat, it's just simply not an option. We do agree with you uh, very much that it's an ideal. Um, so we refer people to different, you know, housing groups here. I won't go through it because we don't have time, but various housing groups that do help people who think they might be able to try to own. We do think that's ideal. Um, our reality in our organization is that our constituents, the vast majority, are struggling to survive. You know, sometimes multiple people to a house, multiple families to a house, and they're just not in a situation to even, you know, qualify for basic home ownership. So I'll leave it at that. But we we do think it's a wonderful ideal. For, absolutely. Um, back to the first one with just cause. We may just politely have to disagree on that. Maybe I don't I don't know if we could, you know, find kind of exactly on, on a short call now, what would make us, you and I and, and, and our organization see eye to eye, but um, I respect your view. I think the way we view it is, you know, I'm not sure we can get to perfection. I think we're, uh, I'm on the steering committee of the Chicago Housing Justice League and Kevin's very active as well. So um, we help kind of move that forward. And we feel that it's so slanted in the reality on the ground of just people getting pushed out and black and brown folks are just not going to live in Chicago anymore. That's that's the reality, right? We're just getting pushed out. Um, we're looking for ways to fight back. We're always willing to talk. Um, but our experience shows us that every little thing is used to, at least with our members, what they tell us in community residents, to kick people out. So again, I hear what you're saying. Um, this would not suddenly allow like no one could ever kick anyone out. Um, that's not that's not what just, we don't have time to really talk about all the ordinance, but it doesn't mean as an owner, you could never evict people. It just slows down the massive and very rapid rate of eviction in Chicago. I'll, I'll, we don't have much more time to to say more, but I appreciate your comments. I'll leave it at that from my side. The only thing that I disagree with you on is that when it comes down to ownership, it is the same program as far as renting. So here, instead of paying it to rent, you're paying it to the mortgage. So it's not the same situation that you have now with mortgages going to the bank or whatever. That money that the housing authority puts towards rent will go to a mortgage. So now your name go from renter to owner and you still have that same money. The qualification is not there. The qualification is the same as renting. I'm just telling you it's a program that, and this is how you build wealth. You know, everybody wealth start with ownership and this is one way that you can do it. It's just something to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that discussion. I'm going to um, raise a question from the chat at 621, the timestamp. Zoe Strong asked, are you working with partners like Legal Aid on this campaign? And Zoe, feel free to um, elaborate a little bit more if, if you would like. Yeah, I was just sort of curious because I have a friend who works for Legal Aid and she's, you know, really, she's in court all day long, um, sort of trying to deal with these cases where she has very little leverage if there's not like, um, there's not just grounds on behalf of the person being evicted. Um, so I just was wondering if you are trying to work with some of these partners to see, you know, how would this work in practice and like how would changing some of these, uh, changing the legislation really pan out like in the courthouse? You want to say something, Kev? Um, truthfully, I, I know the answer to this question, um, but piggyback off me if I mess up. Um, but the answer to this question is yes, we have had, we have worked with uh, Legal Aid Chicago um, and other capacities as well in some of our other campaigns um, beyond just, just cause. Um, we do plan to work, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Leonie, like I said, this is where I would ask for some piggy, piggyback by you being a steering committee member. Um, 
I believe we will be working with them in some capacity as well as this ordinance is passed to try to get more legal attorney assistance for individuals who do not have representation. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, these are already conversations. We've already had conversations about this ordinance as well with Legal Aid Chicago. I'll, I'll simply add that in addition to that, the uh, the Law Center for, for Better Housing, which used to be called the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing, has also been um, a strong supporter of the coalition, and they've offered you know services. So it's, it's an important point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Howard? Okay, I also had posted this so you could ignore it. I want to pick up on the real estate angle from a totally different way. And I, I saw you had extensive policy having to do with eviction, but I wonder where your policies stand in terms of squatters. Well, the, I mean, we, we haven't developed um, a particular policy at the Chicago housing justice league. So we haven't, you know, we haven't come out with a sort of a, coalition-wide stance or an organizational stance um well i, I, I do i do remember your um i didn't we didn't want to answer it at that time it's just to we get to the end but i think you said um you know that during covid um evictions were stopped and the supreme court reversed it right right um i i just i'm speaking from personal experience here i live out in, in a fairly wealthy suburb and uh, if maybe five percent of the houses were abandoned, you know, during during COVID, and uh, as my luck would have it, my next door neighbor moved out, and but we're the this suburb's about fifty percent uh, black, fifty percent white, and uh, my black neighbor moved out, and who should move in but a squatter? They broke the locks. And they moved in, and it turned out to be part of a scam that they, not that I love the banks, but they, they scam, I hate the freaking banks, they're the worst, but the banks get, get held up by these squatters. It's a, it's a whole scheme. And, uh, you know, eventually, you know, they, they were in there for about two months. And funny enough, the mayor of this town had a squatter next door to him too but it was mainly during covid and he couldn't he's an attorney he couldn't touch him but uh so there's some scams with this on the other hand you know i have no idea in the city of chicago if if it's anything like say london where there's a tradition of squatting and in the united states there are various laws that allow squatters to take over properties simply by planting flowers or making some improvement but you know so i was just curious if you you guys had any any sense of, of the squatting scene in chicago um i'll quickly answer that um a little bit touching on what leone said so like as an organizational stance and um for a from a coalition stance from chicago housing justice league which is who we work with um, and work instrumental with in creating the just cause ordinance as well as trying to get it passed. Um, we don't necessarily have a overall organizational stance. However, um, and I won't touch too much on this because this isn't necessarily like a personal conversation um, and like my personal opinions on how I feel or don't feel about squatting and, and people who are squatters or people who are squatting. Um, what I will say is, is that we're open to having these conversations um, I will drop some contact info in the chat if you do want to reach out to us to have these conversations at a later time to kind of talk a little bit more about it. That would be great. We are, we're always open to hearing new ideas as well and then trying to figure out what what maybe we can create to do it. Um, we would definitely just need to and I'll drop my email as well as my I'll drop my email in the chat for anyone who wants to reach out with further questions. Um, and yeah, that's as much as I'll have to say about that right now. Um, it's like I said, I don't want to go too much into my personal views, especially as I'm here representing our organization. Thanks. 
I'll, I'll add, I'll add one thing. It's just anecdotal. Um, so many of the communities where we work and where we have lived or, you know, where Kevin's come up and other staff and board members and, and stuff have come up where I live many, uh, in some cases I've, um, uh, like had an office or organized in areas where several houses, for example, were boarded up and they're boarded up for years, 10 years, right? eight years, 15 years, several houses. And, um, and that did breed some frustration with people who didn't have any housing or were housing like challenged. Right. And so sometimes there can be that kind of feeling like, Hey man, if, if no one's going to do anything with it ever, can some of us like, you know, get in, in the, in the winter, right. Can we go and like find a place to sleep or do something? So, you know, I'm just going to leave it at that for now, but just a lot of the folks we deal with are really desperate. And and then when you see all these houses that where someone's paid, you know, 25 years on a 30 year mortgage, and then they're the bank repossessed the house, and then they're just going to leave it for however long they want. It is very frustrating to see, you know, see that happening when it could be, I don't know, either any housing for anyone or a, a small business that hired three people in the community. So I'm going to leave it at that. But I think sometimes people do feel, you know, pretty frustrated. Thank you so much for that uh, discussion. I'm going to um, share Julian's mess, um, question and then we'll go to Stephanie. Um, so Julian Acabal said, um, has your organization included advocacy for undocumented migrants given the recent wave of immigration into Chicago, helping them get jobs slash housing? Yeah, I'll say something right quick and then Kev can, can do what he wants. But, you know, when we were when we began, many of the people who came together with me to found the organization were undocumented you know, immigrants from especially from from Mexico more than anything. And um, quite a size. But we don't ask people. But, you know, you, you kind of can 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 take a darn good guess. And, you know, uh, quite a lot of folks we work with. Uh, and who are our greatest leaders in our organization, you know, our, our undocumented folks. So, you know, it hasn't been a special thing, I guess, that we've done lately. It's sort of been like from the get go, um, you know, obviously, right. You can't organize low income uh, Latinx people in Chicago and not be organizing a ton of, of pretty, pretty desperate recent arrived uh, immigrants, um, you know, like my parents, right. And And like a lot of our other staff and board and, other folks, uh, parents or themselves. So yeah, it's a it's a very important point that you're bringing up, and we believe that within the African American and, and Latinx, you know, unity and solidarity, that that immigrant part of especially of the Latinx experience is key because many immigrants come and they don't know the history in this country. And, you know, their supervisor or friends tell them, hey, man, black folks, they don't want to work. And I'm not telling you like stuff. Oh, I, I think this is happening. I'm talking about years of experience. Right. Like they say, hey, man, don't feel bad if we're only letting 10 of you get in the van and go work and none of the African-Americans because they don't want to work, because if they work, they won't get government aid. So there's all these things that start happening to people who just come. Um, and on the other side, people who are here of course, of any background are like, wait a minute, we already have two people for every job. Now we have three and people get frustrated. So, you know, what we've been doing for years uh, and what I've been doing for decades is talking about that unity and forget documented, undocumented, this, that, and the other thing. We're all getting up early in the morning, especially poor people and selling our labor. And the last thing we can afford to do, although it's very difficult, right, is to fight each other over those scarce resources. So uh, I'm glad you brought it up. We don't have time maybe to say the details, but that's absolutely a critical part um, of our organization's work. Yeah, I will. I'll just be honest, just looking at time, I won't touch on it. For, um, truthfully. Um, but what I will say is I'm in agreement with Leone still to this day, a lot of our membership and current membership, as well as some of our leadership, our undocumented immigrant immigrants, 
Um, so we do still work hand in hand in trying to solve certain issues around that. Um, but like we only said, not necessarily something specific around the unfortunate migrant crisis that's now happening in Chicago and also a few other uh, major cities in the United States right now. Thank you. I have Stephanie and then after that I have Dolores. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, thank you so much, Leone and Kevin, for your presentation. And we I appreciate so much the work that you do in Chicago as a as a Chicagoan. I'm you started to get into it a little bit with the prior question, but um, you know, I'm also a, a daughter of Mexican immigrant parents and the the idea, some of the rhetoric that you just discussed, right? Anti-blackness is so common in our in our communities and, and in our culture. And when you talked about the racial unity dialogue um, sessions, I'm not exactly sure what you called them, but it it's really interesting to me because I've always wondered, like, how do we approach these conversations um, within the Mexican immigrant community, specifically in Chicago? So I am wondering, like, if you could say more about how this idea of those dialogues came up, if there was something that prompted that um, in the first place, and how do you go about building um, a structure for leading those conversation and what, what that's like? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely have to exercise discipline because you've encapsulated you know, my life's work. Not that I've achieved so great, but my life's passion. Um, they always say you teach what you most want to learn. And that's what I want to learn um, is how to build that unity. So, but you've touched on it. Um, and and, and I, I can't give a complete answer today. Let's stay in touch. Please, you know, go to our website and reach out via name. email. Yeah. And we, or shoot Kevin email so we can, you know, we can put you on our email list. Um, you know, I, what we try to do, I always emphasize, not like, oh, we wrote a book. So now we can do it. There's no book on this, right? You just keep coming and keep coming and you got to believe in it. And then, and then it can happen. But um, a couple of things we try to do is not have uh, theoretical discussions that are not connected to what we're working on, because it 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 is somewhat interesting, but it doesn't lead too far. And what we need to do is, is so I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Let's be real. Um, in in the Latinx community, we say some nasty stuff about black people. Right. Let's just be real. Like, don't anyone on here say no. Just don't say anything because we do. And that's terrible. And it's sad. But we're conditioned to do that because we're scared about shrinking resources. Right. So we shouldn't give ourselves a break, maybe. But we just need to analyze why we're acting ignorant. We're not bad people, but we're acting ignorant. And we've been trained to do that. And black folks, too. Right. They're going to look at us going, man, Latino, he just got here. Now he got what? He got a Rolls Royce. What's up with that? I've been here three generations. Right. And I'm I'm being pushed out of Chicago so we can understand each other's frustration. And as we talk, we really um, urge people to think about a concrete thing we're working on. So as we talk about our fear of each other taking scarce jobs, let's talk about it in local hire targeted hire. Let's talk about it in improving labor standards, right? So that the talk, um, Stephanie, becomes not just, hey, Kevin, uh, gee, you know, I'll be your friend and then you'll be my friend. And well, the, yeah, that's fine. I don't know if I've helped Kevin and his family much by being their friend. I think I help Kevin more by saying, hey, man, let's work together on something that both our communities benefit from, because that's how we prove to each other that we can be allies and be effective. So I think more people, uh, more Latinx people have to have experiences with Black people where working together produced a benefit, right? And vice versa. Once that gets rolling, we'll be unstoppable because there's so many of us. We just have to be more organized. Thank you. I would love to answer so much to that question. I'll be very honest. Um, I will say, please, please reach out to me. Let's say that, because I, I do want to leave the time and space for the last couple of questions. Um, but I would love to go more into into detail um, on our beliefs on that, um, as well as the work we're doing around it. 
um, and specifically about our racial unity dialogues. We're looking for 10 members for our first session. Um, maybe you or one of your one of your um one of your friends or family members are interested to kind of start the conversation within your communities and joining. Um, definitely reach out to me via email. Um, I would drop my sale, but it's so many people in here. I already get a lot of calls a day. So reach out to me via email. And then if necessary, we can then reach out via sale to each other like that. Um, but I would love to continue the conversation with you and maybe possibly invite you to one of our racial unity dialogues that we'll be hosting starting in the second or third week of March. Thank you for extending yourself. And we have one final question um, from Dolores. Uh, hi, Leonet. Thank you for the presentation today. Uh, uh, Kevin, uh, I, my question is about the new immigrants, especially the one who's not speak Spanish. You, you, how you deal with that one who just speak a dialect and they can communicate even in Spanish? Um, so we have two organizers. We have me, our lead organizer. Um, unfortunately, I am not bilingual. Um, I did graduate with AP Spanish, so I do understand some phrases and sentences. I'm not very good at responding, though. Um, however, we do have a bilingual organizer. Um, her name is Frida Diaz. She isn't on this call today, um, but she is normally either available and or with me. 90% of the time during the day. Um, and she's also available via contact info as well as Leone and um, our executive and our director for Women for Green Spaces, Claudia Galena Sanchez, um, also speak fluent Spanish um, mm -hmm. and English as well. So we do have language barriers, um, obviously, within our organization, but we do our best to make sure that we have people in multiple different positions to be able to feel those language barriers that may arise. Thank you. And and we understand that. Um, I, think, I think the barrier that Dolores was talking about is that there's a lot of migrants that don't speak English or Spanish. They speak a, a specific dialect that's um, like to their neighborhood. And so we're kind of um, working with a lot of those groups and not knowing what is like the best mechanism to provide health information, access, resources, and navigate them through work, especially because there's a lot more inequities um, with worker rights when um, you know we can't reach them. You talk. You're talking about like folks from Mexico that have like Mixteco, Zapoteco, like Guatemala, uh -huh. uh, more. Um, so like Maya and mm -hmm. things. I mean, I'll just, I'll simply say, but so we, we, I don't know if we have a great answer, like, Hey, we'll do this. But, um, we, gosh, over, over our time, we've run into that sometimes. Um, and I'll be honest as an organizer, the main thing I've done is usually try to find someone of that language that also speaks Spanish, you know, at, at least, you know, someone, and then, and then try to have that person help us <laughs> to reach out to others. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that's a great help, but, uh, that's, that's a tough one. When I, I worked about 10 years in the farm worker movement before I came back to this part of the country some years ago, and probably 30% of our members from Mexico did not speak Spanish as a, as a mother tongue, uh, Mixtec, Zapoteco, um, Purepecha, like that, Huichol. And so that's what we ended up doing is we'd usually try to find, you know, someone who spoke pretty good Spanish and their own language. And then we would ask them to kind of help us um, do the outreach. But uh, other than that, I'm not sure. Let's just go on that journey together and try to figure it out. Yeah, like a liaison until there's enough uh, saturation or need to bring in somebody. You know, I want to thank you both. I want to thank everybody here. Janice, I apologize. Um, you can ask your question when we um, or have this space open, if um, the speakers feel comfortable staying a few minutes after. But we want to thank you for... Mm -hmm your time and also ask the students to move into the, the group setting. We also wanna remind you about the evaluation, the midpoint evaluation to help us improve. But again, let's give a round of applause to our speakers and their activism, naming some of these very important issues. And we want to remind you that we have Dr. Tiffany Ford next week. We're very excited for her to come in and talk about Public Writing Action Lab. And um, with that, I will ask the students to go into the group of the, the room 
And if others want to stay on for the shared community or to talk or to ask more questions, please do so. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much to everyone and have a great evening.